A weak muscles and high levels of internal fat can significantly raise the risk of diabetes amongst middle-aged women, even if they are not overweight. That's according to a long-term study by NUH, which also recommends a simple blood test to gauge muscle strength. The study hopes the findings can eventually be accepted as a form of muscle strength management for midlife women. Kate Lowe tells us more. Madam Sabarina is on the move every single day. The 59-year-old once weighed 93 kilograms, but she has shed over 30 after a weight loss surgery. She now clocks more than 10,000 steps daily to stay healthy. Because I realised that small change consistently make a big impact on your health. Uh, and your health is not only for your, the body, but also for your mind, your, your emotion, all that. More than just a number on the weighing scale, a woman's fat level and muscle strength tells a deeper story. Researchers at the National University Hospital and NUS Medicine tracked about 1,200 healthy women aged 45 to 69 across all major ethnic groups for more than six years. Their findings show those with both weak muscle strength and high visceral fat are more than two and a half times likelier to develop pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes. The risk rises with either factor alone, but worsens when both are present. Muscle strength can be tested using grip and chair stand exercises, but another promising tool might just be a simple blood test. Creatine phosphate is something that is metabolized and provides energy to the muscle. So that is a very good molecule that can signify whether your muscle is functioning well. So we measure this creatine cystatin ratio as a function of muscle function and mass. And then we relate it to the risk of diabetes. This ratio could be a simple, low-cost, early screening marker to spot muscle decline before it's visible. This means earlier intervention and better outcomes for our ageing women. Prof Yong says more middle-aged women should start incorporating strength training into their routines. This will help protect against diabetes, boost mood and stay mobile just like Madam Sabarina. And we're joined by Professor Yong Yu Leong. He's a head and emeritus consultant of the Division of Benign Gynecology at NUH's Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. He's also lead of the Integrated Women's Health Program. Thanks so much for joining us, Professor Yong. Good evening, Sue. Good evening, everybody. Okay. All right. Uh, let's get to basics, right? So um, muscle strength, mm -hmm. visceral fat, mm -hmm. middle, being middle-aged, and being female. How do all these work together yes. in terms of predicting diabetes? Yes. Uh, you know, the, for a very long time, uh, body mass index or BMI has been the index of whether you're fat or whether you're healthy. But our studies show that around the time of menopause, you know, the hormone goes down, estradiol goes down, and because the metabolism goes down, the women tend to put on fat. So if the lady eats the same, exercise the same, she will put on one kilo a year. And, and then after a while, the visceral adiposity will increase. But BMI not only measures visceral adiposity or abdominal fat, but also incorporates muscle mass. One is good, one is bad. So BMI, a useful index, uh, maybe we should go beyond that and look at what is the amount of abdominal fat or uh, visceral adiposity versus the amount of muscle. Because muscle is absolutely essential as we age. Muscle uh, allows us to do things, to walk, uh, and, uh, and it's sarcopenia. So when we age, um, muscle weakness sets in and that's a big problem. All right, so the idea is that uh, mass, we can gain weight, but if in fact it's muscle mass, that is less likely to lead to type 2 diabetes than if, say, it was gain in mass from gain in visceral fat. Is that the, the uh, Exactly. One is good, one is bad. Mm. Visceral fat is bad. It, it increases the risk of diabetes. Our studies show that if you have uh, uh, normal muscle and high uh, fat, then your risk of diabetes is 1.78 times higher than people who have normal muscle, normal, normal fat. But if you have both weak muscle and high fat, then your risk is 2.8 times higher risk of so, diabetes. So uh, hypothetically, uh, 
I could be fed. Yeah. I mean, as in overweight. Yes, I could. My beer, my, can, yeah, but, but if my muscle is also good, the amount of my, my, my muscle function is also good, uh, that might be better than someone who is not overweight, but whose muscle function is less than mine. Exactly, exactly. We found a lot of the Singaporean women are what they call the skinny fat syndrome. Their BMI is not high. Some, in fact, are very skinny, but the, they are skinny because they have no muscle. Because muscle adds to the mass and adds to BMI. So it's a good thing. Muscle is a good thing. Um, so BMI is a composite of two things, one good, one bad. So maybe it's outlive its usefulness. We should go be beyond that. And all this happens at menopause because estrogen goes down and metabolism slows and the, 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 the weight increases, the adiposity increases and exercise becomes less because you've got hot flushes, you've got joint pains. and So you get a double whammy, increased abdominal adiposity and weak muscles. All right, so this blood test, uh, which uh, I, you appeared earlier on the report of my yes. colleague Kate, yeah. uh, measuring creatinine phosphate, uh, mm -hmm. How does this test, measuring this particular substance, help us identify our risk of yes. developing diabetes? Um, we were looking into the basic biology of muscle and we uh, think that a combination of these two compounds, creatinine and cystatin C, actually reflects muscle mass. And we tried to test it out uh, in our real population, in our uh, IWHP cohort. And we found that actually this ratio can predict uh, the risk of uh, poor muscle mass and gait speed six years down the line. That's truly uh, amazing. Something done today can predict events six years down the line. And that's because creatine phosphate is the energy supply for the muscle. So creatinine is the byproduct and it's excreted in the urine. And uh, the findings of your study, I take it they're, I mean, they're certainly empirically sound. They should be adopted. And that might create the basis for how we manage health for women. I mean, menopause is just one of the contributing factors yes. to this problem. But just yes. anyone managing their body weight as well as the muscle mass. Exactly, exactly. So, so this test potentially could be useful for anyone interested in how their muscle would be or how their gait speed would be six years down the line. Um, but... Um, it is not generally appreciated because we are the first uh, in Singapore, if not the world, to relate it to events six years down the line that we can predict uh, poor muscle mass, low muscle mass and uh, poor gait speed six years down the line. So that's not generally known yet. So it has to be um, validated in a bigger population. And um, uh, once that's done, uh, I, I, I think the evidence will spread and the medical community will quickly adopt it. That's my hope anyway, as a researcher with a new finding. In a way, that's common sense. Even someone like me who's not healthy at all, I'm aware that they always say it's okay if you gain weight, if that's in your muscle mass. But uh, before we get wide acceptance of your findings, mm -hmm. uh, health infrastructure, uh, that we can put in some basic building blocks to lead eventually to wider adoption based on findings like yours. Yes, yes. What building blocks might these be? Yes. Um, Hopefully, our study is validated by us. We are continuing. Uh, and also in other populations, once that's generally accepted, we have a very useful tool. We can do a blood test and predict how fast you will walk six years down the line. <laughs> so we have an early warning system, right? So what is the lady going to do? So some certain steps has to be done. So uh, we were talking to Madam Sabarina earlier on. I mean, she's a wonderful lady, you know. She is a busy lady, she has a career, she has family to look after. So she doesn't have time to go to the gym like everybody else, like women who are half the sky, right? Um, so she tries to incorporate simple things into her life. Simple things lead to big results if you do it every day. Like for example, in the MRT station, instead of taking the escalator at the Bonavista, she just climbs the steps. Now, if you do it two times a day, you have done your resistant muscle exercises for forever already. So right? better than what taking a taxi to go to the gym? I think, walk. Uh, yeah, I mean, going to the gym is good, right? So I think the message is do something that you enjoy. A uh, any exercise is better than no exercise. And not forget, exercise and muscle actually releases endorphins. 
And you know, uh, depression, anxiety has been in the news uh, recently. And um, this endorphin is a natural drug. It's a natural, it's not something you need to take. Because this natural chemical releases when you're exercising, when you have good muscles, and your mood lifts. And Madam Sabrina says so, because she can observe among her friends, those who don't exercise seem a bit down and they don't respond so fast. But those who are active and exercising um, are much more alert and they take things much more positively. All right. Thanks so much for coming in to join us, uh, giving us a theoretical proof, uh, if in case we ever needed it, that getting off our backsides and doing some exercise is likely very good. Every little bit helps, yeah. yes. Thanks for that, Professor Yong Yu Leong, the National University Hospital. Thanks so much for coming in this evening.